Hi, I'm Sunshine Hilligus, Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at Duke University. I want to welcome you to the first in the virtual lecture series for the Julian J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lecture in Representative Government at the University of Oklahoma. I first want to give a big thank you to Mike Crespin, the director of the Carl Albert Center, as well as the Rothbaum family for making this possible. In a series of lectures, I'm going to be talking about youth turnout in the United States. Today what I want to do is introduce the problem of youth turnout and offer you a new perspective about the reasons that young people don't vote. The next couple of lectures will focus on policy solutions. This is work that builds on um, a recent book, Making Young Voters, that I published with John Holbein, as well as some new and ongoing research. Let me first be clear just on why it is that we need to study this problem. So what I have shown here is just going back to 1986, the turnout rate for older and younger Americans. So older Americans, the light blue line, those 65 plus. Uh, young Americans, the dark blue line. So these are 18 to 29 year olds. And across time, there is an enduring massive gap in turnout rates between young and old voters. That's the thick black line is that gap, somewhere between 25 and 40 percentage points difference between old and young voters. And it's worth pointing out that this gap in turnout is bigger than the gaps that we see by socioeconomic status, by race, ethnicity, education. And, and not only that, but it's still there. Even though we saw historic turnout rates among young people in 2020 and 2018, the gap between young and older uh, Americans was still there. So um, I would also point out that uh, Oklahoma it's even worse. So Oklahoma has one of the lowest youth turnout rates in the country. Just 34% of 18 to 29 year olds voted in the 2020 presidential election. Just 30% of those 18 to 24 voted. And um, this is far below the national averages. Um, and in fact, um, only the state of South Dakota has lower youth turnout rates. So I hope you're convinced that this is in fact a problem that we need to better understand and come up with policy solutions. There is a large literature on youth turnout and the conventional wisdom that we see in the media and um, in the scholarly work is that young people aren't participating basically because they don't care. They're cynical about politics, they're disengaged, they're narcissistic, right? They um, really are, are wanting to focus on things other than um, their communities. And so the, the bottom line is that, that if we're looking for a policy solution, um, if that's the problem, then the solution is to improve political interest among young people. The, the problem with this um, conventional narrative is that it doesn't match up to the data. So um, if we look at results of surveys in this particular graphic that I show, it's the American National Election Study going back to 1948, and young people have always been politically interested. Not only are they politically interested, when asked before the election, they say they plan to vote. So some 80% at least say that they plan to vote when asked, and yet they don't. So the dotted line is voting intention. Um, they say before the election that they will um, vote. Um, the, the black line is actual turnout. The difference between those two is what we call a follow-through gap. And we think that this is fundamentally the problem that we need to solve. So, I mean, it would be great if 100% of young people said they were politically interested. The reality is, is that young people are interested they're just failing to follow through on their civic attitudes and intentions. And so if we can figure out why that is, then it offers right, a different take on what potential policy solutions might exist. So we make the case right, that these efforts of whether youth advocacy groups or scholars, or is to, the, the, the goal should be to try and figure out why so many young people fail to follow through on their intentions um, to participate. So um, we offer a number of explanations why we think it's the case. 
Uh, so for instance, um, you know, young people are coming of voting age at exactly the time in their lives that they tend to be most unstable and transient, moving between home and college or out of their parents' house. Um, and so part of it is just a stage in life that might account for why young people are not following through on their turnout intentions. But it's also about the institutional rules, about when, where, and how new voters um, can participate. And that, that those things also create obstacles to following through on turnout intentions. We uh, decided to start this project by just asking young people, you know, why didn't you vote? And what we find is that um, we saw these themes pop up. So there was one uh, young man who said, you know, I, registering intimidated me at first. I didn't know what kind of process was involved or if I needed a bunch of um, personal documents. And when I found out it, it was going to take like two minutes, um, I was relieved. Um, another woman said she was clearly embarrassed about not having voted. They're all stupid reasons, but it all just piled up and I just didn't. I got caught up, friends visiting, and just never made it. Another person said, um, the lack, the, the reason I didn't vote is I feel like you shouldn't vote if you're not educated on who you're voting for. I'm very against voting down party lines. I think that's idiotic. I don't know. I just don't want to be an uneducated voter. So what you see there is that, that combination of both these personal, internal um, obstacles as well as um, those registration and, and voting obstacles. So, of course, some young people do vote. And what we discovered was that the link between civic attitudes and participatory behaviors was really not that different from other behavioral intentions where your goals are sometimes outsized to your action. So whether you're talking about exercising or studying for an exam or eating healthy, that it turns out, right, that what we intend to do and what we um, actually follow through and do sometimes don't necessarily match up. And those who are best equipped to follow through on their intentions tend to be uh, people with well-developed, what we call non-cognitive skills. Um, these are competencies related to self-regulation and effortfulness and interpersonal interactions. These non-cognitive skills enable um, individuals to persevere in the face of obstacles, distractions, and diversions. Um, I would just point out that we're certainly not the first to say that non-cognitive skills matter for um, you know, life success. Um, there's an entire literature out there in economics and psychology and childhood development that has, that has focused on the importance of non-cognitive skills in explaining academic and life success. What we do is say, maybe the civic domain is not that different. So non-cognitive skills, um, again, these are, these are um, capacities like grit and, and perseverance and self-regulation. Uh, they develop in adolescence, and importantly, they've been shown to be um, malleable, to, to be able to be developed um, with intervention. And uh, we are building on and connecting with this literature that has shown that they matter in academics and in career success, and we look to see, do they also matter as a resource in explaining which young people uh, vote and which ones um, do not. Um, so we fit this um, theoretical expectation um, and, and compare it to uh, the classic uh, literature in political science. And it fits pretty well. So in political science, it's called the resource model. There's, there's a recognition that voting is costly that um, that you know because you have to register to vote you have to um, go to your polling location you have to potentially wait in line or deal with inclement weather that all of those things create costs and and some individuals have the resources to be able to overcome those costs now within the political science literature the focus has tended to be on cognitive skills, verbal skills, education as the resources that best able, uh, enable people to be able to overcome the cost of voting. What we're making the case for 
is that non-cognitive skills might be an additional resource that help us to um, determine who's likely to vote and who isn't. Okay, so why is it that non-cognitive skills should matter? You know, as I mentioned, you know, there's recognition that, that voting is costly. And um, some of those are the kind of external costs of voting, the uh, time that it takes to travel to a polling location or get registered to vote. Um, but others are also internal um, obstacles that must be overcome. So, you know, we've all been there. You've had a long day at work. You just want to sit on the couch. Um, your car breaks down or the baby has a blowout. All of those things lead you to not necessarily follow through on um, your intentions to achieve a particular goal. And um, it's the non-cognitive skills that have the, the self-regulation, the self-control, that help you overcome those obstacles to still uh, achieve your goals. It, it's also the case that this other literature on non-cognitive skills really emphasizes that those with non-cognitive skills are better able to avoid some of the things that we might expect would then prevent individuals from voting. So those with non-cognitive skills are less likely to get into trouble, you know, end up imprisoned, and, and so um, are um, you know, less likely to have those type of negative life events that, that might prevent um, voting. Um, in the literature, I, I, I want to go ahead and make reference to um, the notion of grit um, because that is a non-cognitive skills that, that has gotten a lot of attention um, by the media. Um, Angela Duckworth had a very popular TED Talk that you might have seen or you might have seen some of the coverage um, in the newspapers. And it's entirely fine if when I say non-cognitive skills, it's easiest for you to kind of think about the notion of grit. We use um, Angela Duckworth's measure of grit in some of our analysis, um, and, and so it is kind of useful to kind of plug that in whenever we're talking about it. So let me just give you a sense of, you know, what grit um, is, is it, how it's measured and operationalized. So Duckworth asks, um, adolescents um, a series of self-reported questions that includes things like I'm a hard worker or um, setbacks don't discourage me. Um, these are self-reported items that um, are the basis of her grit scale. Um, in our book and analyses we use both that grit scale as well as a variety of other um, measures of non-cognitive skills so including things like teacher assessments, um, behavioral indicators like truancy um, at school and and um, and I, I think that that we use grit where it is available and so it's it is entirely fine to kind of plug that in whenever I'm talking about um, non-cognitive skills um, in the book we look for every single data source where we can possibly test the relationship between non-cognitive skills and voting. And so what we find are a variety of different longitudinal studies in which um, we have childhood measures of, of non-cognitive skills and adult um, participation measures. Um, in addition to kind of finding all of the data sets um, out there that exist, we also collected original data um, from the Wake County um, school system um, it's one of the largest school districts in the country, as well as um, looking at voter files and matching up to some experimental work um, that I'll, I'll talk about briefly. So just to, to get us started, to give you a little bit of a flavor for um, the type of analysis that we were doing, um, what I show in this graphic, um, and, and uh, I realize the font is probably small and, and that part doesn't matter, this is just a, uh, four different um, data sets in which we had measures of non-cognitive skills as well as voter turnout, what you see is this positive, strong relationship between grit and voter turnout. Those with more grit are more likely um, to turn out. Now, of course, this is just a bivariate relationship and, and we can say there's a correlation, but not necessarily a causation. Um, there might be things like cognitive skills, maybe it's the case that um, those with um, lots of verbal skills are both grittier and also more likely to turn out, in which case the relationship that we observe here isn't causal. So we, we want to go through and try to evaluate um, if there is, in fact, a, a causal effect. 
Our first step in doing that um, is to account for, control for, all of the various other factors that could confound the relationship between grit and turnout. So personality, um, cognitive skills, um, parental education, socioeconomic status. Um, these are all things that uh, we're able to control for in um, our um, empirical models. And across the board, each row here is a different data set with a different uh, sometimes measure of non-cognitive skills. And even accounting for those potential confounders, we still find a positive relationship between grit and turnout. So the um, vertical line there would be a zero effect and, and everything is, is, is positive and statistically significant. It turns out some of these data sets though are so large um, that they actually include sufficient numbers of siblings or twins in them to, to do an even more robust analysis. And so taking advantage of a panel study in which we can do individual level fixed effects as well as sibling and uh, twin pairs, we can account not only for those observed characteristics, but also unobserved characteristics as well. And so in these fixed effect model, um, this is kind of the most rigorous way to try and evaluate with observational data if there's a causal effect. And we again find this very strong positive relationship between grit and uh, turnout. Now, the strongest possible evidence would come if we were able to randomly assign some kids to have a little bit of grit and some kids to have a lot of grit, right? Um, and it turns out that actually that intervention exists. So in 1980, 1992, there was a uh, randomized control trial called Fast Track. A group of academics recruited at-risk youth to participate in a program, randomly assigned some to be able to participate in the program and others to not. And that program was really focused on developing non-cognitive and social skills. And so um, there were things like classroom training and peer pairing and home visits, all focused not on kind of academic success per se, but rather on developing the self-control, the behavioral regulation, the non-cognitive skills that we've emphasized have, have mattered so much. Now this original group of researchers, they were interested in like academic success and um, you know, things like graduation rates and um, you know, behavioral um, issues at school and they find these positive effects. They found that this program did improve non-cognitive skills and had some positive um, outcomes we were able to convince them to allow us to look at voter turnout as another possible outcome. It wasn't something they had um, previously considered, but we were able to match those who are randomly assigned to the treatment, um, as well as the control group, to voter files um, to see if these, these kids who were um, part of this program in early you know, childhood um, were, were more likely to participate later in life, and it turns out that they were. And so um, this is, I think, the kind of strongest possible evidence that developing non-cognitive non skills pays off not only in, you know, in terms of school performance, but also in the civic domain as well. Okay, so just to wrap up um, this, this um, first lecture, we make the case that the key to understanding youth turnout is to identify why it is so many young people fail to follow through on their civic attitudes and intentions. So it's, it's not that they don't care. It's not that young people are not interested. They are just not following through um, on those attitudes. What we show is that, that those with non-cognitive skills are better able to overcome the obstacles and distractions that might prevent them from following through on those civic attitudes. This is a new perspective for why it is so few young people vote. And because of that, right, it, it, it changes um, how we think about potential policy solutions. And so the next lectures will really focus on what are the appropriate ways to then increase youth turnout.
And so just to preview, I should say, you know, we make the case that by correctly identifying the problem, we can find the right solution. And it becomes very apparent that the efforts of youth advocacy groups like Rock the Vote that have been focused on, right, making voting cool, on increasing interest, in trying to convince young people that something's at stake in the election, that that's the wrong focus because, because the young people already have those attitudes. That's, that's not what's preventing them from, from voting. So I hope that um, this is giving you a sense of, of um, this important topic, and I hope that you will join me for another in this lecture series. Thank you for your time and attention.